Well, has there been any backlash from the, the greater CrossFit community? Like, I, I don't. I wouldn't think you would hear anything from CrossFit HQ. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it hasn't happened. No. It's the little things for me, like him holding a woman's hand or, you know, caressing her hair or something like that. That my heart rate spikes, and I'm like, I would rather you fuck her. <laughs> Last night, I, I probably would have, Greg would have been like, but you're giving me a gift. And I would have been like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no matter what the answer to how was your date, there's not a good answer in right. those moments. Because right. saying it was not good, you probably won't believe it. If I right. say it was okay, you're like, what do you mean by okay? It's like, and it's like, Or if I say it was great and it was fun, that's not going to be good either. Everybody's fear, whether you're non-monogamous or monogamous or polyamorous or whatever your relationship dynamic is, is we are afraid that the person that we love is not going to love us. They're going to leave us for someone else and that other person is going to be a way better version of you. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Are you going to play with us if it's naked pickleball? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, this trip's getting better and better all the time. All right, welcome to what is now going to be our fifth podcast episode of the Naughty Gym Show, and we have special guests with us today, uh, Kate and Greg. Kate, Greg, welcome back to our show again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well done for um, making it a podcast. I was pumped to see that. Yeah, it's uh, we have no idea what we're doing, so who knows? If this is <laughs> we, we needed something else to do. Yeah. Where, where are y'all? Where are y'all at today? Are you in, where, what country are you in? <laughs> we are in Australia. We're back home. We're uh, away, I think, for about a month and um, all over Europe and then got home and then we were in New Zealand for a week visiting my family. Um, but we're finally back Newcastle, um, just north of Sydney in Australia. So it's been good to be home. Oh, well, we're, we're glad to have you guys on here. We were on your show uh, not too long ago, so now you're returning the favor, I suppose. So just a quick introduction. Uh, Kate, I know, I hope I'm getting this right. You have an online programming business. You have a nutrition coaching company. You were a CrossFit Games competitor. You are, or are, or were, I don't know, still, <laughs> still trying for that. Uh, you are on the CrossFit or were on the CrossFit seminar staff. I don't know if that's still a thing or not. Yeah, um, it's, still a thing. it's still a thing. Okay. So you also have your own podcast. You and Greg both have it together and you are a guest lecturer specifically at an event. We'll talk about eventually in hedonism in Jamaica here in January of next year. So we know you have a lot on your plate. Greg, Greg, do you do anything? What do you do? <laughs> No, no, no. Un unemployed. I'm just riding on coat, uh, Kate's coattails. No. <laughs> Recently, uh, we're not to fly a drone, though, so that's good. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, my, I don't work in fitness. Um, I've got a very uh, plain corporate kind of job. So, uh, yeah, I've done CrossFit Level One and you know trained people in the past, but uh, it's not what I do for work at the moment. So. All right. So we've got what's we're going to treat this first little segment here as a CrossFit workout. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. So you have, you have three minutes. It's a partner workout in three minutes working together. You have to summarize the love story of Kate and Greg three, two, one, go. Okay. So middle of, <laughs> middle of lockdown, Melbourne, 2020, Melbourne was the most lockdown city in the world during COVID. Uh, swiping away on Tinder and came across Kate. And yeah, our first, I think, date was a Zoom date doing this pretty much. Kate was glass of wine, makeup, and just dressed up from the waist up and wearing pajama pants. Um, and yeah, that was how so we got to know each other over the phone for a week. And then we finally met, um, breaking all of the laws to make that happen. Over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I just remember talking to Greg for a week and non-monogamy came up really early on and we both, you know, connected over Esther Perel and a bunch of people that we were just super interested in. So the conversation with Greg was just totally different. Uh, and then the rest is history. 
Um, yeah, we were in Melbourne for another year or so. And then um, Greg's originally from Newcastle, so ended up moving to Newcastle. And yeah, here we are. We were we were open from the beginning. Like we decided we didn't want to do the, the I guess, part that we'd both done in all of our previous relationships. Um, and so, yeah, from the beginning, we'd kind of just dis discuss like what's the dynamic that we want, what are the things that are important to us, and let's just make up the rules. Like let's make our own rules instead of assuming the rules and thinking we're both, you know, playing this like monogamy game that we're just, you know, ha has been handed to us rather than deciding what makes sense for us. So, yeah. And I'd been around open communities. I'd, you know, been sex parties and you know, friends that were poly and all of those sort of things and seen couples and done all that stuff like as a single guy, but I was always doing that. And then I'd get in a monogamous relationship. Like that was like single slutty Greg. And then there was like, try and jam myself into a monogamous relationship and they kept not working out. And, but I don't think that it really clicked to me of like, oh, I could actually be in a monogamous relationship until sort of when I was in Melbourne, I started to make some friends that were doing it. And I sort of started to see more people that were doing it well and, you know, learning more about my own communication. So yeah, then meeting Kate and she sort of said she was interested in it. So yeah, it was just kind of good timing. How well, we going for gonna, time? We're, we're going <laughs> to dig into that a little bit more in a minute, but you guys just yeah. got engaged, right? Yeah. We did. Yeah, we're, we're literally about to hit our three year anniversary and Greg proposed in July while we were overseas. So, and I know you're probably going to get asked this a lot and I think you touched on it on your last podcast episode. So does that mean now you're going to be exclusive? You're going to be <laughs> monogamous? You're going to lock it down? <laughs> Everybody is, I just feel like that is the natural thought or the natural process that people assume. And I don't know if it's because, you know, people are so happy to hop on the relationship escalator where it's like, okay, well, we date, we become official. We, um, you know, do the hard launch on Instagram. We move in together. We get engaged. We buy a house. We get married. We have kids. We just wake up and die. And then that's the end. Like, right. I, I think people are quick to assume that every step is this new level of like, maturity and there should be certain behaviors and things that go with that. Um, so I don't know if it's that or if it's because they assume that if we were just dating and we were being open, we were just more casual, right. even though I've never felt more committed to a relationship in my life. And like, you know, I feel it's funny. It's this blend of like all the feelings that I would assume people that are super committed in monogamous relationships. I'm like, I have those. And I have these other things and Greg has these other things. Um, so it doesn't feel like that was casual at any point, but I know mm -hmm. for my mom, I, I remember telling my mom and she was like, well, you know, let me know when you guys get serious. <laughs> so I wonder if that question comes from, I just assuming that, you know, we weren't serious until now. And now that we're serious, we'll not see other people. Right. Um, but no, nothing, nothing is changing. Yeah, I think people have a view of like what marriage looks like in the same way they have a view of what a relationship is and what the rules with that are. That are like marriage, like, oh, that's when you like commit and you stand there and say like, I'll never look at anyone else in my life again. So yeah, I think people kind of have that view. And yeah, like Kate said, like it's that like, you know, less serious thing. Like, you, you know, when people just think you're going through like a phase of like, oh yeah, you're doing that. But then you get married, like, of course you're going get, like, to get serious. Because people say the same thing about having a kid as well. Right. It's like, oh, well, like you guys will stop this when you have kids, right? And it's like, right. no, like it's, if it's part of your values and part of what you want for the relationship, then, you know, I don't think it needs to change. I almost argue that it's more important when you are married kids, when you become more and more intertwined, because, you know, a big part of the non-monogamy thing is feeling, finding a way to continue to be individuals and do your own thing and practice, you know, cultivating, not just the relationship, but cultivating two people that are trying to be their best and live their best self, best, best lives. So I'm like, man, imagine, I can imagine having kids like needing to have a date on my own and get out and hang out with other people. And that, that actually being a really beneficial thing um, in yeah. the same way that people, you know, want to go out and spend time with their friends and get away from that identity that they're glued to when they're at home being a parent, being a partner. Like I'm like, it, it just provides that same kind of like just autonomy um, that 100%. I think, you know, if you are monogamous is probably a little harder to do. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, it, there's only more reasons for me to do it, for me to think that it would be be good for us to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah, that's well said. But you're right. You can look at. I don't know a percentage, but a lot of the people that we see that are in monogamous marriages after 10, 15, 20 years and two or three kids, they really do lose themselves. There's no um, separation. They kind of morph into their children and their partner and there's no dates and there's nothing special. Um, there's no fire anymore. Uh, so being able to continue to grow as an independent person is super important um in a relationship so yeah uh but, but you guys failed the three minute thing <laughs> you asked another question <laughs> you didn't extension and That's you right. didn't call time so <laughs> <That's right. laughs> all right so and we're going to come back to some more of the non-monogamy stuff in a little bit but um kate the first part the first question or series of questions here is for you that uh, a few years ago you know, you have this successful CrossFit career. You're, you're well known in the community and you got a lot of followers and stuff on Instagram. You put a post that I remember seeing, I don't know if this was two or three years ago up. I think it was about dildos or vibrators or something. <laughs> and uh, and you lost a lot, of, a lot of followers over that. And I think you lost followers over some other, you know, sexually related posts as well. Was that a, was there one post that was really the impetus for a big fallout of some of your uh, following? And if so, like what happened with all of that? How did you feel when you lost that stuff? And did it make you question whether or not to be public about your sexual side of your life? We would like to invite you to a first of its kind event, unlike anything ever done at Hedonism Resort in Negril, Jamaica. It's called Be Better at Being Bad Week. This is the fittest party in the lifestyle. Now this doesn't mean you have to be a hard body to attend. This party's for anyone and everyone who wants to improve their relationship and communication dynamics, increase their sexual health, learn better wellness practices, and explore and expand their mind, body, and sexuality. Experts from around the world will descend on Hedo to help you be better at being bad. Daily keynote talks, interactive technique sessions at the nude and prude pools, exciting competitions and workouts, integration workshops on cannabis and psychedelics, intimate couples yoga, speed dating, and workshops in the Kama Sutra Palace. All the nightly themed parties and entertainment that you've come to expect from Hedo and the grand finale, the Red Ball. This event is perfect for people exploring the idea of opening their relationship. Special sessions led by the Naughty Gym, Naughty Gym team of experts will guide you through various Q&A and orientation sessions to help you get to know your fellow attendees. Veterans of the lifestyle can expect all the same high energy sexy parties and electrifying entertainment that made Hedo famous with a little extra flair from the Be Better at Being Bad team. Everyone will leave with a wealth of new tools and experiences curated by our all-star team of professionals designed to improve your journey through consensual non-monogamy. So what are you waiting for? Join us January 6th through the 13th of 2024 at Hedonism Resorts for Be Better at Being Bad Week and get ready for the fittest party in the lifestyle. There's always a recurring pattern whenever I talk about non-monogamy or sex or anything outside of the realm of just like, you know, exercise and CrossFit. Um, and I think what it is, is anyone super conservative or religious who in the CrossFit world, and as you guys know in Alabama, like there's a large population yeah. of people that are, you know, CrossFitters and very religious or very traditional and conventional, I would argue, um, that <laughs> see that stuff and are just like, that's not what I signed on for um, mm -hmm. and have no curiosity, have no interest. In fact, probably quite aggressively disagree with it and have, you know, reasons to believe that it's not a good thing. It's not positive. It's not even neutral. Like it is bad. Um, so I think it, it brings out all of those people that are following me for purely fitness and purely just, I don't know, inspiration or um, watching coaching and CrossFit stuff. So I think one, it, it just exposes the, the followers that, you know, are, are purely there for that. Um, and then I think the other thing that happened at the time is I was already talking about sex and being quite explicit, um, very much like adult themes in my stories. So I felt like I'd already ventured into that territory, but I hadn't changed any of my, you know, public posts, I guess. And so, you know, what happens on your stories is actually a very smaller 
small percentage of your followers mm -hmm. seeing it. And so when I did a post that was like, literally it was a video on my bed with a doxy wand, which is like the world's biggest fucking vibrating <laughs> wand. A, um, it was a Satisfier Pro and something else. I cannot remember what it was, but it was just like three different clit stimulation toys. And it was like on the bed and I just walked through each one and the benefits and what you should do and like how I use them. <laughs> and I think it was the first time a lot of people had ever seen that stuff in general but certainly had ever seen it from me. And so I think that a lot, I got a lot of people going, oh, I thought I was looking at like, you know, massage gun reviews. And then I was like, this is not a massage gun. Funny story, <laughs> April had one of those things in her nightstand that her youngest son found. And that's exactly what she told him it was, was a massager. And then he quickly Googled it and found out that it was not a massager. So we had a very candid conversation that yes, mommy masturbates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that it just was probably a shock. It was totally a deviation from my typical content. And you know, it is it, the pages CrossFit Kate, CF Kate. So I think, yeah, it's a, a diversion away from what people signed on for. So yeah, Whoa. yeah, I lose my followers when I talk about it. Um, and even actually recently, while I was overseas, an article came out uh, about me. I did an interview with uh, um, with Morning Chalk Up. Yeah. The catch that I didn't, I couldn't read the comments when I, when it first came out because the title of the article, I was just like, oh my God, shoot me in the face. It was like from CrossFit seminar staff to online sex educator or something like absurd that I was like, I am, I won like, putting CrossFit's name in it to calling me a sex educator. Right. Like I don't talk about my relationship. Like, so it was an outrageous title, but the comments were really, really funny to read when I read them a few weeks later when I was in the right headspace. Yeah. Um, and it was the perfect example of the types of people that I lost. It was like people that were like, please find Jesus. Um, people that were like yeah. laughing <laughs> at the religious people that were getting all uptight, people that were, complaining that this wasn't the right kind of content that for them to post that it wasn't news that you know just like all these things where i'm like this is just that's where people's heads are at and it yeah. was a perfect perfect way to we kind of were reading that. we were reading the comments we actually had we commented but because it was very similar to some things that we had experienced too but like like clutching their pearls and like oh my god our children and i'm like there is not children <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was, a, I get more mad about that kind of stuff when it's, and I mean, you know, we, we don't know you guys real well, but we have this connection with you. I get more mad when it's somebody I consider it a, like a, a friend of mine than I would if it was something that I had said. Right. And so I was getting mad and was ready to like start typing responses to people. <laughs> and then I, I, I never mind. I'm not going to get involved. <laughs> I did the same, Scott. I started to type something. I'm like, no, just stay out of it. It's fine. Oh, but I, I always think that, like <laughs> I'll have to go and see what you wrote, April. I always think about like, you know, the amount of people that always come up to Kate and are like I've had people say to me, like, I bought my first toy because of Kate. I, you know, did this because it like I had my first threesome. It's like for every person that probably unfollows for that stuff, it's like you're helping ten people. Like mm -hmm. and I think that's the part where it's really easy to kind of go, Oh, I lost these many followers. It's like, but how many people did you help in that process? Right. So you know, yeah, those people you probably don't want them following you anyway. The for precious sure. ones, for sure. <laughs> well, you didn't you didn't shy away from it. The topic of sex was that was some of this kind of backlash from just what I would call PG thirteen post. Was that the <laughs> impetus for wanting to start the podcast, or was there another reason that you decided to start that? Um, I just like talking about it. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> give me Weird another too. outlet. Give me a platform to do it. Um, yeah, it just seemed like a thing that I really enjoyed doing and it was taking on a bit of a life of its own. And it was like, what's another, what's a better way to do this? Like, how can I have a, more conversations with Greg, more conversations with people that are interested in it? Um, Cause like the Q and A's were just getting out of hand and they were super fun and super raunchy and it was great. Um, and it just felt like a fun thing to talk about. So that was kind of the birth of the podcast. It was just 
how do we talk about this more? Like Greg and I were listening to tons of podcasts, right. you know, trying to find stuff on social media. And we were like, why don't we talk about what we're doing? Um, and just be another resource. You know, it's like the more people talking about it, the better it is. And I've had now people who have come up to me that have found us because of the podcast rather than finding it because of social media, like my Instagram, which has been really cool. And I was like, yeah. how did you, how did you find it? And they were like, it came up as a recommended podcast on Spotify. Um, so I think Spotify has kind of started to take on a life of its own and has just been pulled into people's algorithms, which is like, it's, it's kind of cool that it's happening. Um, so yeah, the podcast just came out of, I've always made social media something where I just talk about my life and experiences and, you know, the, the different things that are going on for me. And it started out as, you know, fairly innocent, like talking about, um, weight loss and talking about periods. And then it was talking about acne and hormones. And then suddenly talking about more and more personal things like disordered eating and then relationships and dating. And then that morphed into sex. So it's just, it's just that I've gotten more confident with talking about stuff. So now I keep going. And I think, you know, I still wrestle with people giving, you know, writing the comments and, and unfollowing me. That's still a hard thing to deal with. Um, but I think I simultaneously get pissed off and I'm like, yeah, fuck you. I don't even want to follow me. You know what? I'm going to post more shit. So I get rid of all of you people because I don't want you. <laughs> So I get a little bit like a little bit a case of the fuck you. So yeah, yeah, I like that though. What I really do love about your podcast is it is educational, but it's also entertaining because <laughs> you are just telling your stories, but it's not raunchy. It's not you know explicit in the sense that you know I don't know children could probably listen to it and get education. Not little <laughs> children, but you know. I think, I, you know, I think I don't think you're talking about, about their kids yeah. to their kids about yeah. stuff like this. Yeah, I, um, I think we both are pretty good at just talking about sex and genitals and bodily fluids. You know, without feeling weird or using different words. You know, so I think it's like right. it's sexual, but it's it's mature and it's just casual at the right. same time. Right. So um, yeah, I think that's yeah. probably better now. Our tone for the podcast. Yeah. Well, has there been any backlash from the, the greater CrossFit community? Like, I don't. I wouldn't think you would hear anything from CrossFit HQ or anything like that. But I guess that's all possible. Has there been any of that kind of stuff? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. It hasn't happened. No. I think they're too on the side of like free speech, you know, say what yeah. you want, they get backlash for what they say about certain, you know, diets or sugar or diet, you know, like c Coke and soda. So yeah, I think they're fighting their own battles and they're not that interested in my little Instagram posts, but I, do, <laughs> I worry about it. I might wake up fired one day. I don't know. <laughs> I think if it, didn't, I, I, if it didn't happen from the morning chalk up article, I think you're okay. Yeah, like that, that's when I saw that, say, oh, that might be it wasn't just too long ago, there was a guy who lived in our area that worked on the HQ staff who made a derogatory comment on his Twitter about the LGBTQ community and he oh. hashtagged CrossFit. Ru Russell Berger, I don't know if you remember that. And he yeah. was Im immediately, he was from our town, um, immediately dismissed from his position. And so he I was feel like, like one of their main lawyers slash representatives for the business. Right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it's like public relations type guy. So I feel yeah. like they're trying to be sex positive. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that you've, you haven't talked about anything yeah. that would cross any lines. Yeah. Like. Yeah. All right, well, we'll so see. Greg, you had, you alluded earlier, you were involved in some, some forms of consensual non-monogamy before Kate. Yep. Did you, did you talk her into this or Kate, were you already, <laughs> how did that happen? No, like I, I forget exactly. Like I think on our first conversation, like Kate said, we were talking about Esther Perel and I was like, okay, she's read some of those books and like, Esther doesn't talk about non-monogamy, but like you can see in the themes of what she talks about, about, you know, creating space and independence. And it's like mm -hmm. some of those things, like if you kind of align with what she talks about, I think the concepts tie in really well. So we started to talk about some of those things. And then we just started to talk about like past relationships. And there was enough things in the conversation, I'd say, that were hints that she was at least open to me talking about it. And one of the things that I would out coming out of my previous relationship, I'm like, I always would like hold back my thoughts and hold back until I really knew that like it was going to be received or I'd really think about that. So 
I decided before I met Kate, like the next person I meet, I'm going to be upfront about the fact like I do go to parties and I am involved in this community and at least feel out like, hey, how do you feel about that? So I think I did sort of raise it fairly quickly. Kate actually had been on a virtual sex party like that week or something like that. And I'd sort of said, look, you know, I've, I struggle with sort of just being upfront about, you know, dating and some, like stuff like that. That was on the Friday we had our first Zoom date. On the Sunday, I'd been to see someone. Um, and after that, we spoke and uh, like Kate said, like, what have you been up to? I'm like, oh, I just went and met up with a friend. And then I went, wait, I'm like, that was a lie. I'm like, I actually just went and had a hookup with someone. Um, <laughs> and in that same conversation, she ended up telling me that she'd been to a virtual sex party that day, maybe, or within the day. So, and yeah. then I went, Oh, tell me more. Like, and then so I started to get like drawn out of her. I'd be like, oh, but, you know, what's interesting about that? And then I ended up saying, look, I also have been involved in this. So. You were so coy. You were like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I wonder what he's not ready for this. <laughs> Next minute, he's like, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, no, it's it's not one of those. I think like people definitely do have that thought sometimes. Like, oh, is one of us being like forced into this whole thing? But yeah, definitely not. It, it came out very naturally, and yeah, through just a bunch of sort of small conversations that all joined up to something where we were like, hey, this is what I'm interested in. Yeah, I think but, like I when I met Greg, I'd been going through maybe two or three months of being like, dating is the worst. I get out of these relationships, and I'm like, thank God. And why am I trying to be monogamous? Do I even want kids? What am I doing with my life? And so I was just questioning everything. Um, and so when I met Greg at that point, I, I actually did, was trying to deliberately be single because I think I'd always been on the lookout for a relationship, to be totally honest. I was always like, oh, I just, I'll date casually. And if it works out and becomes something, then cool. But I think secretly I was just looking to fill like a boyfriend shaped void or a husband yeah. shaped void, um, which is a phrase. I don't know where we heard that from, but it's just my favorite. Husband shaped voids is what a lot of people are out there looking for. And I think secretly that was, I was playing it chill. I was trying to be mm -hmm. like the chill girl to date and the chill girlfriend and chill whatever. Um, but I would always hope for it to develop and to become serious and for them to want to commit to me. Um, so I just got to this point where I was like, hang on, what am I, what am I doing? Can I just be single and make connections? Um, and so once I got my head around, I don't want to develop anything for the sake of developing it. I want to connect with interesting people and have interesting connections and, and pursue and invest in the ones that I like. And then I'll leave the ones that I don't, and there can be multiple and connections for me as well. At that point, I was like, you know what? I am putting romantic connections above all of the other connections I have in my life. And I'd had this really cool moment reading um, a super feminist book. Like, like now I think back and I'm like, Oh, it's a little bit painful, but it was called, um, I don't know you pretty or, um, woman don't owe you pretty something like that a woman called Florence given um and she just made me kind of sit back and go I've been doing so much to try and impress or prove or be enough and I was like I just you know why am I I guess making one connection the be all and end all when I could I suddenly could see myself single for the rest of my life and yeah. having an, a really amazing fulfilled life because I have amazing people around me and amazing connections. I had like my best friend, I had my training buddy, I had my gym friends, I had my family, I had my, like my brother I'm really tight with. So it was just re realizing that, you know, all of these people going, I don't want to die alone. I'm so scared of turning out like my single mom or my single dad. Mm -hmm. I'm so afraid of being single for forever. And it was like, man, you were running from that feeling so fast that you're not actually sitting down to think about what that would actually feel like because right. if you do i think you realize that being single is by far not the worst thing in the world and if you have connections that you invest in in other ways like you could be single and be really happy if you wanted to yeah. so i'd had that realization of i could be super happy being single for forever because my life is super fucking awesome yeah. um and then i met greg and i was like oh this is a cool connection all right let's pursue this connection and i was like i'm not looking for a relationship just by the way <laughs> 
But, um, really yeah, so I just was questioning everything and it was just great timing to meet someone like Greg who also was super curious, super introspective and just loved to like explore all of that stuff. And like, it wasn't, wasn't set on just accepting the way that other people did it and the way that we've all probably been kind of told or, you know, the messaging or the conditioning that we've all had from the world. So it was, right. yeah, it was just yeah. timing. It, well, and that's where we're taught, you know, there is a natural progression. You graduate high school, you go to college, you get married, you have children, you do, you know, you're committed to one person. And thankfully you took the time to find who you were and have some free thoughts because a lot of people do, they'll just settle for good enough because they're looking for that person to fit into that husband shaped void. And they'll just take the first one that they think is good enough. I can, you know, we can probably have pretty kids and have a nice life together. <laughs> And then they really lose themselves. And you guys seemed like you were just both at the perfect spot in your life, perfect timing um, to have companionship, but also be happy on your own. I'll say one thing. Um, I was always thinking when I met Greg, I was like, oh, imagine if we met earlier, like imagine what it would be like meeting the younger you or like, you know, 20 year old something, Kate meeting 20 year old something, Greg. And then it was like, we wouldn't have worked. <laughs> It wouldn't have worked out right. We, we say either. that all the time. Oh, yeah. Ten years ago, <laughs> we wouldn't have worked. <laughs> yeah, we but, needed you know, to go through all the shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's what makes, that's one of the biggest benefits, at least to me, of this open relationship journey that we're on is that it's not easy. It's, there's, you know, I'm not out here trying to preach to people, you should be non-monogamous because it's much easier than monogamy. But it does fill our life with, constant sources of excitement. I mean, you know, we're, it's always like, what's the next thing around the corner? And, you know, our life is never dull and, and we get to live a life that we think most people can't or refuse to even try. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful for that because that wasn't the first half of my life, mm -hmm. but I'm happy mm -hmm. that it's, it's on the back. Half. And, and we were listening to uh, one of your very first podcasts, you guys, I mean, it may have been your very first one where you set boundaries for your relationship. I'm curious, uh, have those changed since that episode? Yeah. Oh well, yeah. There's been, there's definitely been changes since the start. I think that we haven't really set a lot of boundaries or rules really from the start. I think we set out with a couple of really basic things and, and I usually say it's more about how we just communicate is the, the main part of it. I think the only things that have really changed, you know, moving in together, there was some, you know, obviously, you know, not changes, but, but re like introduction of new components because our mm -hmm. life had changed. So you obviously need to ha can keep having those conversations about, okay, now that we live together, what does this mean? How do we navigate this component and this component? So there's been changes like that. I think there was, I can think about moments where it was really close and almost like easy to like reactively put like a rule in place. Um, I still remember there was one conversation that me and Kate had were away. I, I was interstate at the time and we had a conversation on the phone and I'd sort of said like something I wanted to put in place and then I rang her back like two minutes later and went, you know what? Don't worry about that. Go and have fun. Just enjoy yourself. Like, because <laughs> I realized that I was just kind of reactively out of a fear of myself trying to put, put some kind of barrier in place to, to protect myself. And then I went, wait, that's stupid. Don't do that. Um, so I think we've been pretty intentional from the start on if we do start to think about like, you know, people talk about veto rules and things like that. Like, I remember we had discussions on those things of like, like, do, you, do we do that? And we're like, why would we? And what's the purpose? So I think understanding, you know, and what I tell anyone is like, if you go to put a boundary or rule in place, like try and understand why you're doing it, because that's kind of the journey. And that's the important part of this whole thing yeah. is to go, well, you know, the introspective part to go, wait, what am I actually scared of? Like by, you know, I've met people that have a rule around, you don't see the same pe person twice, or you can't, you know, I know Kate's met people, it's like, you can't pay for the other person's coffee or drink if you're out for a date. Like, there's all these things that you can put in place. It's like, what's that protecting, I think is a really good thing to kind of ask yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think most of our boundaries or rules that we've had in place and that, and that was a dictionary sized list of rules early on. <laughs> but I think for 
and they're different for the two of us, the things that, that, that we want to put in place, but they seem to be trying to protect us both from the same thing. And that's the fear of losing each other, losing yeah. each other to somebody else, somebody we perceive as better for that mm. other person than we are. And mm. uh, the longer it seems that, that the longer we're in our relationship, the more confident we get in the foundation that we've created, the less or the fewer boundaries that we have, yeah. but it's, it's mm. an, it's an ongoing process and ours have changed tremendously mm. over the last seven years or eight years. Yeah. Well, it's just continuous communication. You never stop. It's always, you know, asking, he's really good at asking very probing questions that make me think outside of the box. And then if I'm feeling some sort of way, he's good at saying, why do you feel that way? And I'm like, I don't fucking know because I do. <laughs> <laughs> But I think to like what you were saying before, so like that almost choosing the like the challenging path is, you know, I, people would listen to what we're talking about here around like rules and talking about that all the time and go, God, that sounds difficult. But it's like yeah. the difficult I, I've used it in the past, like an analogy about the gym. It's like, look, going to the gym is difficult. It's hard. Doing CrossFit is difficult and hard, but it's like in the long term, that's really beneficial. And we know that it's like, right. it's much easier, much, le much less challenging to sit on the lounge at home. Your legs don't hurt. It feels comfortable, but is that the right choice in the long term? And, and what I see in a lot of relationships, it's like, you know, I've even now we've been together three years and it's like, you see so many relationships start and end during that period, which has been really interesting now being in my longest relationship ever. And it's like, because people kind of stay safe and stay on the couch in their relationship and don't choose to do the hard conversations. And even if that's not choosing non-monogamy, but still having those conversations about your fears, about what you want, like all of those things. And I, I just think that's what people are missing out on is, you know, this path makes you choose, like go through those challenging hurdles. But I think the long-term benefits are massive. Well, I'll give you a good example of that exact thing. It's such a good point. Um, and I really haven't, she knows what incident I'm talking about, but I haven't said to her what I'm about to say to all of us now, but <laughs> we had our first, <laughs> she, she, I'm we, glad we can be here for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we had our, now that, now that people in our community know about oh. us, we started doing some local stuff and we did our first local meet and greet this past weekend. Yeah. We were hoping, you know, 10 people might show up. There were 50 plus that showed up to the store oh, cool. and, and, and we were overwhelmed. Uh, I'll, I'll long story short, uh, we were, it's ending. It's like midnight at this bar. And a lot of the people there had decided they wanted to take the party to another, you know, bar that stayed open later, a dance club. And they had asked us to go, Hey, we want you guys to go with us. We're like, okay, we'll go. Let us settle up the tab and everything. Uh, so I'm going to let him <laughs> tell his story because it gets a little bit, um, I don't know. I'm telling he this exaggerates correctly. exaggerates it a little more each time. No, I'm telling it correctly. She's going to minimize it. But uh, so she goes to the bar to settle up our tab. And I'm talking to the owners, you know, thanking them for letting us be there and everything. And I, I talk to them about 10 minutes and she's still up at the bar. And then they say their goodbyes. And I look up at the bar and instead of paying her tab, she's she's waiting for a tab, I suppose. But there's there's a guy up there that she's talking to. Probably the most good looking man I've ever seen outside of TV. Yeah. And I could tell she thought he was good looking. And he wasn't with our group, though. Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> we're, just, we're just some single guy at the bar. And she's acting in a way she just doesn't usually act. I mean, she's like, ha, ah, oh, yeah. And her hands are all over him. And. <laughs> Normally, this wouldn't bother me because I've, you know, he's never seen me act like that, though, in no, eight years. No, and I mean, this it, guy that's very rare. Most men, I get bored very easily if they can't hold a conversation. Um, and, you know, I it, just I don't it wouldn't have I'm mattered. not impressed very easily. It wouldn't have mattered if this guy could hold a conversation or not. She was smitten <laughs> from the moment she laid eyes on him. And so I, uh, I sat back there and I was going to let it just play out because, you know, we've talked to you guys, we we've had our little separate dating experiment and, and that went really well. And, and it's probably going to happen again. And I'm, so now I'm in this inner turmoil of, huh, she could probably get a date with this guy, but I also want to fight him, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, um, so I set, I, I, I decided though, that I, I didn't want this to go on because I wanted us to go to the other party and it was time to go. And, and, and I was now sitting by myself. 
So I walk up behind her, put my arm on around her back and whisper, not whisper, I talk into her ear and say, hey, have you gotten the uh, tab paid yet? And I've got my arm around her. She is not looking at me. She's looking at the other guy, <laughs> but he's looking across her at me. This woman never acknowledged my presence, never turned around, never acknowledged that I was talking to her, that I was touching her, just kept right on talking to her new uh, boyfriend. And this guy was looking at me like a creep. Why is, why is this guy touching on my you know, this hot girl I'm talking to at the bar? And I finally just got embarrassed oh. because she, she wouldn't acknowledge And I just walked off and sat by myself at a table at the back of the bar. Oh. And now I'm fighting mad. <laughs> this goes on for another 30 minutes. She never, she never, she not exaggerating. I looked at the clock and she never looked for me. She never turned around. And uh, finally I had had enough. I, you know, I had thought about leaving. I was just so, and, and she's never done anything like this to make me angry in any of these like uh, lifestyle environments we've been in. Uh, I finally went up there and I walked up in between the two of them and she goes, Oh, here's my husband. Where have you been? And she goes, hey, Scott, I want to introduce you to whatever his name was. She knows because she got his name and number. Uh, and uh, she said, uh, I've been talking to him about non-monogamy. And I'm like, well, I bet you have. But it's <laughs> <laughs> so I have no defense other than I don't drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and um, people kept bringing me champagne and I'd take a sip and set it down and then they'd bring me another one. And so I had <laughs> too much to drink. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the part, she, the part that Not I have, the part that I haven't said to her uh, is that I have, a, this was, this was uh, like five days ago and it has rattled me so bad that I've had trouble sleeping. I haven't, you know, we use the, whoop. we've had a lot of discussions about it. We use the whoop strap and I have been in the red for five <laughs> nights in a row. So I can't sleep. Uh, but the inner turmoil has been, and this is what I haven't confessed, but I've been tempted to tell her, call the guy, message oh, him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to act so excited about it. Really. Yeah, April just goes off camera. And, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, because I want to have that, I want to have that tough moment in myself. I want to take that path that's the harder path because I know she would have fun, obviously, on this date. Um, and I don't want to be the guy that was, that let his insecurities rob her of some joy that she could have in her life. Hmm. But then I also can't sleep thinking about that. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's, well, it's a different, the tables have turned a little bit because you've not experienced that in eight years. I've experienced that a lot because you've met, there, I don't know, a lot. You, you connect really well with women, but I've not ever had that kind of like connection with a guy in the lifestyle. Not like that. I mean, right, you've had good yeah. connections, but yeah. not with this guy that looks like he just walked off the movie set of a Marvel movie yeah. or something. Uh, wasn't bad. <laughs> anyway, we got to like, in the conversation. All right. <laughs> we're, we're only human. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But we ha we've communicated and it wasn't, you know, we didn't go home fist fighting and yeah. shouting and it was we've had really good conversations around it um you know i apologized i never want to you never want to hurt somebody's feelings but he also understood that i would never do anything maliciously yeah you know mm -hmm. to i i know hurt his feelings. i know on the inside that this was my issue and not yours at least the the insecurity of seeing you have that kind of instantaneous uh attraction yeah. to somebody like that now, I was irritated that you completely ignored me when I came up there, but <laughs> I also felt like from the get go that you didn't do that intentionally. You were just caught up in the moment. Yeah. I want to know you guys recently, Kate, you went to a sex club by yourself. <laughs> Greg, I wait, wait know. a minute. Did Greg know this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, was, okay. it was, uh, she talked about it. <laughs> but I want to know. What was going through your head, Greg? Like, were you super proud? Were you worried? Were you nervous? 
Yeah, so, and, and I... By I've... the way, Greg is the most relaxed person on the planet. <laughs> I've never seen him annoyed or nervous. <laughs> so it's great. all internal. It's all internal. I don't externalize any of it, which is completely healthy. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, I think like, so in the same week I'd been to the club that we've been to together by myself as well. So I also had a solo club experience. Okay. Um, but I definitely, you know, the biggest things that come up with dating, like Kate going on dates is her safety. Um, I always have, from the start, it's probably been one of the biggest things I worry about. So her being in a foreign country on the other side of the world, in a country, you know, in Prague, which, you know, I suppose non English speaking, like all of those things, um, definitely a lot of like internal, like, oh God, is she going to be okay? And I think right. because of time zones, I was in India for work at the same time. So we we're opposite time zones. So I was sleeping while she was there. So all of those things really compounded. So yeah, definitely fear around like, is she safe? Is she okay? But at the same time, she'd been talking since really early on in our relationship about wanting to go to a party by herself because I'd done that before we met. So Kate had talked a bit about that being an experience that she really wanted to have. So I was proud of her in that way. And like, was really glad that she was getting to go and explore that herself. So yeah. And, and that's generally the theme I think for dates that she'll go on is like, I'm worried about her security. I wanted to be safe. Wanted to have a good time. Um, you know, both of those things exist at the same time. Yeah. How, did you have fun Kate? It was a mixed bucket. It was really hard being the only like single speaker, like single language speaker, I guess. Like I was like the only non-bilingual person or multilingual person there. So I was relying on people being able to speak English mm -hmm. and also wanting to speak English. I think, you know, even I do it when I see foreign people come up on dating apps, I'm like, it's going to be hard to have a conversation with them. And I'm more inclined to swipe them because I'm like, I'm looking for interesting conversation. And if that's a barrier, then like, uh, um, so I totally had the, you know, karma. I was the person that couldn't speak the language. So that was really hard. Um, and then I felt really insecure because I was the, and I kind of always am the biggest muscliest person there, but out of the woman and the men, like, you know, in Australia, yeah. there's more of a, fit like active culture i think and people are very outdoorsy and they get their shirts off and then men you know really proud of having big jacked bodies so yeah. you see that more and you see fit women as well but in the middle of prague in europe and like you know eastern europe it's like very thin slim woman is the thing and i even had a conversation with one of the guys and he was like you're not my type and we ended up playing and he was like i liked you because of your charm or charisma something really lovely but he was like you're not my type physically I just, um, I got over that because you were so nice. And I was yeah. like, okay, thank you. But he kind of said it really, he said it very matter of fact, very straightforward. He was like, I'm into very slim European woman. Like that was it. And it was like, you know, we are all attracted to what we're attracted to. Right. So it was a really bizarre experience with a lot of um, challenges that were unique to being in a different country with people that didn't speak the language. Right. Um, it was a cool club. It was an interesting place, like very cool setup. Um, I probably am not rushing back to go to a party on my own, although it would be good to do one in Australia, like, you yeah. know, at, at the place we go to and I'm regular and I kind of know people, but, um, it was definitely worth doing it once and just totally were you, like, were you just trying to get out of your comfort zone and do something different or what was like, just as an experiment? Yeah. I just wanted to do it on my own. Like I just, I guess, yeah, I wanted the challenge. I wanted the, I wanted to see what it was like. And I, I, I think I'm also attracted to the, not the freedom, but maybe the autonomy of being there and not thinking about Greg and not thinking about what does he need and yeah. wrestling with my own feelings yeah. when we're playing together, because, you know, we go to clubs or parties and there's stuff that you have to work through actively when you're watching your partner be with someone else. Yeah. And I'm pretty quick at it now. Like I'm pretty good at it now and it doesn't hold up any play, uh, but it's certainly work and it can pop up and become a bigger thing in moments. And I have to really like try and regulate and be like, Hey, Greg, I just need a moment. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to, I guess I wanted to, at the same time as being challenged, also opt out of some of that work in yeah. a weird way, if that makes sense. Like yeah, I kind absolutely. of didn't like, which is, you know, almost picking an easy option while simultaneously it was a big personal challenge. 
Um, but yeah, I sat at that bar on my own and I was like, I've never gone out to a club or a bar on my own in my life. And here I am like trying to make people want to fuck me in 10 minutes. It was like, <laughs> it was super strange. But um, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I think, you know, you were asking Greg, like, how did he go? And I think, you know, we both had the experience of each of us going to a party on their own. We've had, you know, big dates apart. We've had Greg's had to deal with me having a sleepover before and ironically the big events i prepare much better for them and i set myself up and i work through a lot of stuff and we have big conversations and we do the check-ins and the follow-ups and right. you know all of that stuff i am often now more thrown by the little things mm. that we don't think will be hard yeah um last night was the perfect example greg met, went to meet someone it was like a walk by the beach nothing more no play nothing like straight like from the beginning he said we're not playing it will not be that kind of a date and you know we've gotten really good at if there's any possibility greg will let me know now because it's like if i assume there's not going to be and then in the middle of the date he's like hey we're going to play i'm like huh so <laughs> yeah. we're good at you know assessing what's happening and what we would like to happen even if we're not sure um, but last night I just got, there were like, I was thinking, oh, he's going for a walk on the beach. It'd be really quick. And then it was longer than his normal walks are. He normally does the middle of the day as a work break. This was an evening thing. We have Thursday nights, just solo nights. We do our own right. thing. And I just like started to get super anxious and feel super insecure. And what you said at the beginning, Scott, which is everybody's fear, whether you're non-monogamous or monogamous or polyamorous or whatever your relationship dynamic is, is we are afraid that the person that we love is not going to love us. They're going to leave us for someone else. And that other person is going to be a way better version of you, yeah. more attractive, smarter, clever, like funny, you know, all of your, all of your worst fears. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, he's obviously falling in love with her. He's been gone for so long. <laughs> Oh my God, they're obviously like, just like turning it into a whole night and it's going to be yeah. amazing. And she's gonna be so much prettier and she'll have long hair instead of short hair. She'll be skinny instead of muscly. Oh my God, she'll be so right. smart. She'll have a job because she gets paid way more than me. You know, I'm just like yeah. my whole, you know, I, be, I said to Greg, I'm like, I feel like I become very dramatic and a little bit of like an existentialist or narcissist, narcissistic existentialist. I'm like, I become a pity party and the world is ending, ending yeah. and everything is like absolutely maxed out worst experience <laughs> ever. So it was like, you would have not expected after all, all the things we've done. I, I'm like, why was that such a big thing for me? But I think it's because the little things were like, it's just a little thing, like whatever. Yeah. And I don't do a lot of that work. Yeah. So, you know, three years in, I'm like, okay, I need to figure out what, what do I need for each different thing rather than assuming there's like a hierarchy of what's hard and what's not hard. So it's what like, it's gets all hard. you when you get worked up like that? Cause I've done the same thing and I've said it before too. It's the little things for me, like him holding a woman's hand or, you know, <laughs> caressing her hair or something like that, that it does the same thing to me. Like my heart rate spikes and I'm like, I would rather you fucked her. <laughs> it, <laughs> how do you get back to a baseline? Uh, I wish I could tell you how I do that. Um, <laughs> look, it's probably gone from taking like maybe two or three days to now being a matter of hours. I think, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am a massive stonewaller. I just want to shut down and run away. And I'm like, I'm going to start a new life. I'm going to move cities. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to get back into CrossFit competing again. Like, you know, I just plan this whole other life to avoid it. <laughs> oh my God. So, that, sounds like you. that sounds just like, you know, like, well, I guess I'll just take the mortgage and we'll split the cars up. <laughs> It's just like you plan for, you know, the worst possible outcome and it's like, the, it's so hard and the only way to fix it is to run. Right. So I think for me, you know, the thing that has helped has been waving a white flag a little bit as early as I can. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually spend some time in my own space, yeah. which, you know, that sounds very mature, but last <laughs> night I was like, I'm just going to go freak out alone. Okay. <laughs> Ran from the kitchen into the bedroom and just like sat there for a while oh. and then eventually I reach out and it's like I know Greg 
will back off. Like I know that now. Um, and sometimes that's hard. Sometimes I want him to be like, no, <laughs> let me come and grab you and I'll make this yeah. big gesture and I'll be the Prince Charming and I'll save the day and I'll ride in on my horse. You know, it's like, yeah. I, sometimes I want that, but I know that he's like, holy shit, I'm going to let her have some space. Right. And so I will often have to be like, hey, can you like, come here, come, come sit down yeah. and then we'll have a little reconnection. And then we'll, we, last night we, um, we started talking about things and sometimes I kind of, it's hard. Cause once you get into it, you have to really get into it. And then both people are explaining what's going on for them and both sides. And then you kind of have this like wrestle with it. Yeah. And then suddenly it's like, it's midnight and we've been here for so many hours and it's like, how do we get past this? You don't want to stop in the middle of the, the most tense point, right. but you also are, you realize that you're not really accomplishing anything. So we kind of have talked about playing with, you know, do we just hold off talking about if it's, if it's shitty, maybe we just like hold off talking about those details until the next day. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. Cause I'm, I'm like, I want the information as well. I'm like, tell me everything. Are you in love? Are you guys, are, do you need the ring back? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, tell me more, tell me about it. And he's like, it was okay. And I'm like, what do you mean? Okay. Like really good. Okay. Or not, not good. Okay. Yeah. That's, I said to her last night, I'm like in those moments where if there is tension, there is a bit of like, you know, fears or whatever, like no matter what the answer to how was your date, there's not a good answer in right. those moments because right. saying it was not good. You probably won't believe it. If I say it was okay, you're like, what do you mean by okay? He's like, and it's like, or if I say it was great and it was fun, that's not going to be good either. So right. I think it's like in those moments, it's always better to just go, look, that's an irrelevant point right now. What's important is us reconnecting and you re reminding you, Hey, I love you. Hey, we've been together three years and look at this thing on your finger. Um, and, and kind of just then realizing like none of that shit matters. It doesn't matter whether the date was an hour or two hours or three hours. What matters is what like our relationship, like before when you're talking, like I remember, and I still do it now. Kate goes on a date. Like I almost feel like it's like a little internal mantra that when I get scared that I have to like repeat internally is like, she loves me. Our relationship's great. Yeah. And it's like, I find myself going, look, it does it like whether she's having a, an amazing time on a date, whatever the facts are external to that, the only thing that matters are those two things. And it's like, I just have to always bring myself back to that and go, she loves me. Our, major, our relationship's amazing. Nothing else matters. Yeah, and that's, think, you know, for me, that's how I self. I think self if I too. knew, I think if I knew a hundred percent that I was not going to lose her, no matter who she went out with or who we played with or I don't think I would have hardly any insecurities regardless of who the guy was or the girl. Uh, and, and so I know that when I feel those insecurities rise up, that it's, it's just coming from a place of fear that, and I want to work through it. That's why I brought the fact up that I, I would be tempted to tell her to try to contact this guy and see if she get, because it's a, it's, it would be a great test of whether or not I could do the mental gymnastics and the mental work that I need to do to put this mm. monster to bed. Yeah. But I don't know. That but, I and, and I think like on the other side of that, Scott is like, she goes and meets this guy that's, you know, looks like he's from a Marvel movie. She comes back. She still loves you. She's still in the relationship with you. You know what that does for you internally? You go, Oh, okay. Like it's self proof to go, Oh, wait, she can go and see the guy from the Marvel movie, but she's back here with me. Like, yeah. you know, and that, that, that's, I think the internal challenge of all these little moments, it's like working through that hard thing and going, look like, yeah, it's a rough path. There's a challenge there, but it's like, always like the um, Ryan holiday obstacle is the way it's like, you know, go through the obstacle because it's like on the other side of that is, is only amazing things for you internally and you guys in your relationship. Well, that's yeah. how, that's how every step of the, our relationship has been. You know, we, we started with baby steps and I mean, really tiny baby steps. And we would try something and go, huh, that wasn't bad. That was actually fun. And then we would try the next step and the next step. And along the way, there's never really been a step that we thought, well, we can't do this. This is just mm -hmm. not going to work. They've always been unfounded fears. And on the other, mm -hmm. like you say, on the other side of that challenge has been uh, a shoring up of what was already a fantastic foundation of our relationship. Mm. Yeah. I remind myself, I don't own him. There's no ownership here. He is a freelance <laughs> partner. Um, and 
I've been in a marriage where my husband cheated there and I was married to him. We were in a monogamous relationship. Nothing I can do is going to prevent him from leaving if he wanted to leave. <laughs> so I have to trust that our relationship and our love, the foundation that we've built is strong enough or it's not, it either is or it isn't, but nothing I can do or say like me holding on to him and being jealous and no, you can't do this. We have these rules, this rule, this rule is going to prevent that from, from happening if it's going to happen. And so that, I don't, maybe that sounds crazy, but brings me some relief from the spinning because my head will spin and I'm like, she's skinnier than me. She's prettier than me. Um, you know, let's split the house. Let's split our things. And I'm like, wait a minute. If he wanted to go, he's, free to go whenever he wants to he would be crazy to leave me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny it's funny she has the same insecurity that kate you mentioned uh, yeah. a minute ago that you get in your head about having muscly bodies but us guys love that or most guys do love that and and if <laughs> i'm if i'm playing with a girl who has a good body but it's a more traditionally thin body and not as muscular that's the woman that gives her insecurities you know, I, I try to lavish praises on her. Yeah, about that's the way something she's I'm working on in myself, though. So. Yeah. That's an internal that's thing. Funny, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, what yeah. you said was really good. Yeah. It's almost like, hey, if, if he's going to leave, he's going to leave. And it's not in my control. Yeah. And, you know, you said at the end, like, he would be crazy to leave me. And I think, for me, my best moments have been when I go, you know what, I, I actually have something of value to yeah. offer as a partner. Like I yeah. am, I, I I do provide and I, I am a good partner and like I have to remind myself to be confident in my almost just capacity to be here and be with him and be the kind of partner that I am most of the time. Yeah. And so reminding myself to just be confident in what I have to offer. And right. then I think, you know, building on what you said where it's like, it's, it's not only do you want him to go and live his own life? It's like, I, and I, you know, I think sometimes you get into this territory of like giving them permission or mm -hmm. that they have to ask for something, but it's not that it's not territorial or any right. kind of ownership, but it is a nice way for that helps me think about it where it's, it's actually a gift. Right. And he gives it back to me. And when I can think of it as like, this is a gift that I get to give him and it suddenly turns it from this scarcity feeling of like, he's taking something from me and right. I'm gonna lose something and someone else is gonna rob me of my life. It's like, no, it's abundance. It's like, he's got this and I get to give him more. Like I get to be a better partner by doing this. Right. So it kind of reinforces that idea of like, be confident in yourself as a partner and let yourself give them this gift. Um, and that just is like, a 180 mental flip for me when I, when I can do it, when I'm in, when I can do it. And, you know, last night I, I probably would have, Greg would have been like, but you're giving me a gift. And I would have been like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a little bit <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's great. But it, it is like that. It's always a funny thing on dates. Like even, you know, I'll spend, if, especially if I'm meeting someone for a first time, probably half the time I'm talking to them, I'm talking about me and Kate and our lives and our relationship and, you know, how fucking amazing it is. Like you're telling this other person, it's like you end up coming away from a date being like, you know, you've just spent all this time replaying like how you met and what your story is and all of those things. And you end up walking away being like, Oh fuck. I love my girlfriend, like my fiance, <laughs> I was about to say my girlfriend, but you know, like it, it's a, it's a really funny thing where it's like, you know, that, you you think about your partner on a date you're like oh they're just like flirting and talking about like each other and all it's like but the reality is and i know it's you know the same for anyone where it's like yeah you end up talking about your relationship you talk about your partner and oh yeah we did this and we moved here and yeah i don't know i just think it's uh, i always walk away from them kind of going i've just spent like an hour or two talking about my relationship yeah. my imagination is much worse than the reality 100 percent, all the time about, yeah. about about two or three weekends ago we had our first separate dates and uh me and uh the girl i was out we did we talked about her husband and my wife a lot over the course of that date you know talking about how great they were and um we got back, the four of us got back, they were, they're married as, to each other. So we got back and we were all re talking about how the night went. And uh, 
And we told them that, that yeah, we, we talked about you guys all night long and they go, huh, we didn't talk about y'all at all. <laughs> <laughs> but that was intentional. That was intentional. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. I find that yeah. happens, but not intentionally, because guys just don't want to fucking talk about relationships. It's so hard to find guys that are interested in talking about non monogamy and sex. I'm like, well, this guy, him and I are very similar in the way we process things. And so it would have been easy for both of us to not have independent conversation outside of talking about our relationships. That would have been the easy way for us to handle the night because we were both yeah, really not... stepping out of our comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Just really chose the easy way there, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Everything <laughs> just said. Well, no, he has very good conversation very easily. And that's why he connects with women so quickly because he has yeah. very thoughtful conversation. I, on the other hand, get very uncomfortable and like, don't know what to do with my hands. And you so know what to do with your hands at the bar the other night. <laughs> <laughs> She's learning. She's learning. It was a growth moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, uh, all right, so let's let's, let's close this out. As we, we've been going about an hour now, but we do have some final questions, and some of these are kind of goofy. But Kate, you're well, you're both coming to our event in Jamaica uh, in January of next year, and Kate, you're going to speak and and do some things there, and, and we're looking forward to that. Um, and we're going to talk about that. But before we do, April has a big dream. Oh yeah, this is a, about this, a, this is a lifelong dream that she wants to start a commune. <laughs> Uh, that's fitness oriented, but open relationship oriented. Do the four of us need to start one together? Uh, you know, I, I'm just throwing that out there for you, you to think about. Contract, I'll sign it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Is it in Alabama or Australia? No. So it's gonna. I'm looking at property in Columbia. So <laughs> okay, I'm in. It's like 120 <laughs> acres. We'll grow all our own food. We'll. <laughs> I, I really have been talking about starting a commune for years. All right. So serious question. I've been a lot of followers when we do that. I so. Oh yeah. yeah that, it should be an easy way to sell some real estate. Um, what is the, what's the ultimate goal for you both? Like what, you know, you've got all this stuff going on in your life. If you could snap your fingers and next year, you have everything you wanted the way you want it and it's rolling in the, the direction you want it to go. What is the ultimate goal? Are you doing it now or would you like to see things tweaked just a little bit differently? I actually, it's funny that you put the question that way asking like, what's your goal? I think something that, especially with getting engaged and talking about, you know, marriage and what that means to us and family and what we're trying to create. A lot of that is wrapped up in, a goal that is a mutual goal for us, which is, you know, building a life that we share that is all of our dreams, you know, on these prongs supporting an umbrella and the umbrella works and we're, you know, doing all the things that includes, you know, being open about the way we have our a relationship that's not just following handed to us rules, um, building a family by having kids and raising children together. Like that's a shared goal for us and just, instilling values you know in our community which you know maybe it is just him and i at the moment and maybe it'll have kids and one day it'll expand further it's like i think that yeah just it's almost like it's not the goals themselves it's the desire to have mutual goals yeah. that's almost like that's my dream like to be with a partner that i can build mutual goals with him. We want to build wealth together and we want to have properties and we want to do all these exciting things and travel. It's like, that would be my perfect relationship. And we're, we're in the midst of building it. Yeah. So the goal is to share goals, you know, and, and be with a partner that wants to do that to me, at least. I think for me, like it's happening. Like, I think it's really easy to get lost in the Oh, we're doing like we kind of get there. It's like we've been doing it for three years. Like my dream relationship with my dream woman. You know, my life is amazing right now. To answer your question, maybe two things. For me, I've just finished my like Gottman Level One sort of relationship coaching. So that's you know an area that look. I, if I could click my fingers to your question now and be doing either relationship coaching, non monogamy coaching, helping men in relationship, whatever that is, like I would love to click yeah. my fingers and do that. 
Um, as far as like bigger picture life goals, something that I heard on a podcast a long time ago, and I always say to Kate, and it's something that I sort of think about a lot is this podcast. Um, and the guy I was talking about here had his grandfather's 90th birthday. And he said, he looked over and he saw his granddad over in the corner crying. And he went over to him and said like, Hey, are you okay? What's, what's up? He was in tears. And he said, you know, he's like, everything's great. He said, I'm standing here. It's my 90th birthday. And I created this and he was an Italian immigrant in America and he had like three generations. He had his kids, his kids, kids, you know, all there in the backyard with him for his 90th birthday. And I always say to Kate, like, that's what I want to create with her. Like, yeah. I want to be that age standing there going like, look at what we created. And that's like my guiding, you know, light I'll say in a lot of ways where it's like, that for me is the goal for us to be happy, you know, healthy, and and looking at this amazing like generational legacy that we've created yeah and that's at our commune <laughs> yeah in, in columbia at the commune <laughs> okay. Just checking. I'm, glad, I'm glad we're all on the same page <laughs> uh all right last few questions yeah. <laughs> these are kind of goofy but um you guys haven't been to hedonism before so are you planning on being completely naked all around the resort <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm not prude, but I'm also okay with wearing clothes at times. I feel like maybe I would be better at socializing with clothes on because I'd be really distracted. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's a weird, but there'll be moments of being butt well, naked. Well, I'm don't sure. be, look, if you're both like in the nude pool and you're naked and you're talking to people, don't be creeped out if I'm like 15 feet away just watching how that unfolds. You that's know? <laughs> if binocular, that's yeah. weird. All right. Yeah. Are, are you, we're going to, so we're going to be teaching people. Uh, I don't know if this is a big thing. Oh, yeah. Have you ever played pickleball? No. Okay. All right. We're going to be teaching it. Um, Naked. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Are you going to play with us if it's naked pickleball? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there sure. you go. Uh, this trip's getting better and better all the time. All right. Is there, any, <laughs> is there anything about this whole trip that makes you nervous? You've never been before, and there's, you know, when you, when you go into a new venue like this, a new type of experience, you can have nerves. Are there parts about this that make you nervous? Oh yeah, the whole thing. Um, but I, I really like that. I, I, nervous to me is a really positive experience. Totally different from like anxiety or yeah. fear or you know the insecurities that we've probably been talking about a little bit on this podcast. Nerves to me translates to like fuck yeah, I'm doing something challenging and scary, and this is really exciting. Yeah. And I don't know if that's from years of you know I was a performer in, in dance and um, performing arts prior to being a CrossFitter and then a CrossFitter and competitor like you are performing and you, you do get nervous and you're competing. And that to me has always been a pump up. Um, and so I like the feeling it's a little high. So I, I lean into the nervousness of it. I think it's going to be really good. It's almost like the first time is the best time because yeah. you can't necessarily recreate those nerves the second or third time you've done it. So yeah, I'm, I'm super nervous and also super excited. Yeah, it's the same feeling I think of going to a club, maybe for the first time or, or every time in a way, like there's nerves, you think about your body, you think about like, am I, you know, are they going to be just full of a bunch of people with six packs and I'm going to be the one that doesn't like, yeah. there's all these things that go through your head, but the reality are you get there and it's like everyone from different body shapes and it's like, oh, it's fine. It doesn't yeah. matter. So yeah, I think that's, you know, yeah, it's maybe that same feeling of like excitement of going to a club, but also like, I don't know what I'm walking into until yeah. you get there and then it's fine. <laughs> well, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, we can't wait to meet you guys there. Tell us, uh, yeah. tell us before we close out, you know, where can people find more information about you both and about, uh, Kate, all the stuff that you do virtually. We pretty much, I exist on Instagram. Greg's on Instagram. He's a little bit more private than me. <laughs> um, so see if Kate is my Instagram account. We also have gone rogue podcast, which is our Instagram account for our podcast gone rogue um so yeah the gone rogue podcast instagram is pretty quiet um but it's a home base that you know i want to turn into something and um actually start sharing more stuff but all the juicy stuff is in the podcast yeah my instagram is just gj wolf um like i said i like 
it's not private, but I, I don't really talk about non-monogamy and things. I do want to, but I'm every time I like interview someone for my corporate kind of job, I'm like, are they going to go look up my Instagram and find all of my secrets? So <laughs> One day we'll I'm, a little, I'm a little bit more like, oh, I don't know. So yeah, I don't, I don't post as much. Do you guys have a photographer following you around? Because your Instagram pictures and videos are always just spot on. <laughs> I do some stuff with like people that help me create content and then okay. we've got it pretty good with our iPhones. Just this morning I was talking to um, one of the girls like about how you can film in certain modes with low exposure and I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> so we were slowly figured out a few tricks, but yeah, I actually do have someone try and do some content creation stuff for me and we get, we get photos done occasionally or I do. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're going to put all of your contact info also in our show notes so people can reach out to you. And we are super excited to see you guys January 6th through the 13th at Be Better at Being Bad Week at Hedonism Resort. And it's not too late to join us and you can meet Kate and Greg in person. Um, all right, guys, thank you so much. We know it's early morning, so you got a big day ahead of you, I'm sure. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule for us. And we will see you soon. Thanks, guys. Always Thank good to talk so to you. Thank you so much.